our next speaker for taking time out uh, from this extraordinarily demanding schedule. You have his biography. <laughs> Last night I would underscore Larry Summers drew ideas from two people that he cited. One was Alexis de Tocco and the other was Michael Porter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Porter. <laughs> Well, David, uh, as much as I love Columbus, uh, I wouldn't be here without David's gentle prodding. Uh, he uh, helped us lead a life sciences summit here in uh, Massachusetts. This is our core cluster in our economy is life sciences, and uh, we got together all the leaders in that in that sector uh, here six months or so ago, and David helped us organize that session and led that session and I got such a large debt <laughs> that I uh, could could not resist uh, anything he wants me to do and, and this is not this is not repaying the debt this is just working towards <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, and it, it's a very interesting group the other thing that attracted me about about this is that all of you uh, given the roles that you play and the important jobs that you have are actually here doing this this doesn't happen very often uh, in my experience, uh, most uh, times it's the government folks. I don't know why we're ringing here. Ringing for me. Is it ringing for you? I think, you know, I might just bag this. Do we need this? No. no. Okay. There we go. That might help. Uh, a lot of times, this whole notion of building a community and building the economy is, is left to government. It's left to uh, people that are running the chambers of commerce and the uh, various economic development organizations and principles. <laughs> I got the and it's ringing. Hold on. It's, it's going to be it. It's muted. Will that do it? Yeah. We got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's usually left to kind of the people whose job it is to do economic development, community development, and the fact that the principles are here willing to participate is, is something I find very, very unusual and, and very, very... Uh, Encouraging. Uh, I've done a little bit of work, actually. We've looked a bit at the Columbus economy, and, and I think you should be here. I think there's some real issues uh, about the vitality of the economy. I don't think the economy is performing uh, at a particularly advanced rate. I think it, there's some danger signs here that we need to talk about. But I think the, the first step, and you all know that, presumably, because you know your data. But, um, but I think the first step in kind of revitalizing a region is, is really to get the leaders together to feel committed to being part of the process. Because as I'll say in a minute, we found that the whole process of community and particularly of economic development has changed over the last 10 or 20 years. It used to be a government-driven process. Now we find that if it's a government-driven process, it fails. Now it has to be a private sector-driven process in which the business community and the university community uh, are absolutely driving the process rather than sort of uh, lobbying in uh, complaints and requests for, for the government officials. So the fact that we have this group here is really extraordinary and, and, and that more than anything else, he, even David, really attracted me to be, be part of this session. We have very little time today uh, and uh, what I'm hoping to do is just get you interested in the subject uh, of, of, of competitiveness for a region and, and then competitiveness of the urban core of that region which is we find is a particular challenge. Uh, if this is at all interesting then hopefully we can find some ways to continue the dialogue uh, when we'll have had more time to collect more data and do more analysis and, and give you more value hopefully uh, in today, what I do today. Today I'm only going to give you sort of the basic overview of how we think about a, a, a metropolitan or regional economy how we think about its prosperity, the drivers of that prosperity, what we've learned about some of the key uh, uh, issues and challenges that every region has to address. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, if I have it, on the, the economically distressed urban core of regional economies, which is a major issue all across the country. And then with that, we'll take a few questions, and, and hopefully that will be intriguing enough that, that this dialogue will continue either among yourselves in Columbus or, or involving us, us here at Harvard. I have, I, we've kind of prepared a little bit of a data pack on the Columbus economy, drawing on our data sets. We have very, very uh, large data sets on regional economies in the United States. And I'm going to hand that out uh, at the end, uh, but I, I've learned over time, if I hand it out at the beginning, uh, nobody listens. And I have so much uh, to cover in so short a time that I want to make sure that you listen to me. So 
you'll get all these slides and, and uh, uh, don't worry about that. Um, uh, 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 hopefully, I, I want to kind of give you a kind of a mental map or a mental framework with which to look at this challenge of, of economic uh, development. Now, I think the first thing we, we've got to understand is what makes a region competitive? Why do some regions improve their prosperity, grow jobs, grow income? Why does that happen? Well, we, what, we, what we've come to understand is that the competitiveness of the region it is, is based on the productivity of that region, the productivity with which that region can use labor and capital to make valuable goods and services. If a region is a very productive place to do business, it's prosperous. Uh, now, productivity is the value that's created for every day of work and every dollar of capital invested in that region. If every worker in that region is producing a lot of output, valuable output per day, you can pay yourself high wages. If every dollar of capital invested in your region is producing a lot of output, uh, you're going to earn a good return on that capital. Uh, and, and that's the kind of iron law of prosperity. If you're productive, if you can produce a lot of output per day, uh, and a lot of output per dollar of capital invested, you can be wealthy. But if you're not productive, for whatever set of reasons, uh, your, your, your incomes are going to be held down. You're not going to attract your fair share of the new high wage jobs and, and so forth. Regions compete to be, to be the most productive place to do business. Now, obviously, productivity has a lot to do with skill. It has a lot to do with technology. It has a lot to do with infrastructure. It has to do with a lot of things, which we'll talk about later. A couple of additional points uh, that I want to make here. It doesn't matter so much what particular fields a region competes in. Whether you do shoes or whether you make uh, plastic products or whether you're in semiconductors, actually turns out not to matter that much. What matters is how sophisticated and productive you are at whatever you do. Uh, and we find that you know, many, many people get into the mindset that we have to be in high tech. I talk, when I talk to groups like you, everybody says, oh, we've got to get into high tech. We've got to get into IT. And, and actually, that's not correct. In fact, what you find is that high tech and biotech and those new emerging technology industries only represent about 4% of, of, of jobs. And even if you're wildly successful, that will never be the, even close to the majority of your employment. Uh, what you need to be is productive in all of your industries. You're never going to save your economy by trying to grow a biotech, cl biotech cluster or an IT cluster. That's, that, 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 those are good. Those can be helpful. Those can be part of a successful economy. But you've got to learn to be productive cr across the board in your economy in whatever fields you have a, a, a expertise and, and, and uniqueness in. And we'll talk about that later, and I'll show you some of the Columbus data. So don't get to seduced by picking winners. <laughs> They're all winners. You know, the shoe, Italians get rich making shoes because they can sell them for 500 bucks a pair because they have the best style and the best design and the best skill and the best brands. You don't have to be in semiconductors to be prosperous. You just have to be really, really productive. And the good news in this modern economy of ours is every field now is high tech. Every single field in the economy is high tech. You can employ advanced technology to do just about anything from moving packages to making shoes to drilling for oil to, to whatever it is that you do. So think about your fundamental role in building a prosperity in your region is raising the level of productivity of whatever you do. And we find that you want to build on your strengths rather than dream about getting into some entirely new field that you don't exist in today because that never works. That's what we do. Okay. Now, what allows you to be productive? Uh, I, uh, some years ago, I introduced a, a, a theory that's uh, 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 about the competitive uh, productivity of locations. And it says that in any location, to be really productive, you need four things. Number one, you need very high quality inputs, very highly skilled people, very efficient infrastructure, uh, very good uh, supp uh, uh, low cost supplies of capital, and so on. A strong <coughs> scientific base so that companies there can access that scientific um, infrastructure uh, to help them uh, compete. So you need, you need good inputs. It stands to reason if you're going to be more productive, you've got to have better inputs. You can't have the same old people and the same old, tech, same old technical base and the same old infrastructure being more productive. You need, you need the inputs to rise in quality. 
Uh, you need the right incentives so that the competition is a productivity oriented competition. So many of these things are said in Washington in, 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 in your case. Uh, you need good intellectual property protection, you need investment incentives, you need a strong antitrust policy so that firms don't, can't collude, they actually have to compete. Because we find that when there's a lot of local competition, uh, you tend to have uh, uh, productivity improvement. Uh, and we see that in, ma in many sectors. In order to have um, a, a productive economy, you, you take advantage of sophisticated uh, local markets. We find that regions are often competitive in those fields where they have very sophisticated local needs. Where your local market, where your local customer, where your local needs are very de demanding, that tends to allow you to enhance your productivity and, and your sophistication in that field. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why Italians are so great in, in, in making shoes is that Italians are very sophisticated customers of shoes. The average Italian spends more on shoes per year than any other nationality, but they buy fewer pairs than almost any other nationality because they buy very high average quality. Wouldn't, wouldn't dream of going to a Kmart to buy shoes. They want to go to a specialty store. They want to talk to an expert. Uh, they take their time. It's a three-hour experience. It's that sophisticated local need that helps them maintain their vitality and their dynamism to drive their productivity up over time. So you're looking in your economy, where are you demanding, where do you have sophisticated needs in your industrial base, in your consumer base, that's one of the things you're looking for. And the final thing you need to be really productive is you need clusters. A cluster is where you just don't have one firm in a given field, but where you have a whole cluster of firms in that field. Uh, this is a great example of a cluster, California wine, 745 wineries in California, not just one. 4,000 growers of grapes that are independent of the wineries. 95% of all the wine produced in America is actually produced in California. Uh, many people think it's because of the weather. But it, it actually isn't. There's lots of places in the United States where you can grow fine wine. If you, any of you read the Wine Spectator, you'll know that. You'll know you can do it in Oregon, you can do it in even Long Island. Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the reason that California is so successful in this field the reason they've gone from making Bartles and James to $35 bo dollar bottles of wine is they become very productive, very, very high skilled, very advanced in this field. They have a cluster. There's a lot of firms, but there's also all the associated supporting industries are there in that field. So a California winery that wants to borrow money doesn't have to go to their local bank and put up their house for collateral. They can go to a bank that knows their business and has loans where the great, uh, the, where, 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 where the, uh, the aging inventory of the wine is collateral. Those of you here that are bankers, do you have any loans where your lender can put up inventory of wine as collateral? Of course not. Because you don't lend, you don't have expertise in that cluster. But in California, all the ad agencies, all the banks understand that cluster and have specialized lending programs a specialized uh, program. So that shows you some of the benefits of a cluster. When you have a cluster, you can be very productive. All the skills are there, all the technology is there, all the expertise is there, the suppliers are right there, you don't need inventory, everything is just in time. Um, and so when we look at an economy, what we see in, in all uh, advanced economies is that we see their, their cluster. We don't see a random distribution of industries in the economy of any region. We tend to see regions unusually strong in, in certain fields, where they have that critical mass which allows them to be more productive than some other location. And that and, and so you want to build on those things when, when you're building your economy. I've got some data later uh, uh, we, we can show uh, you. I've already really made the point that uh, uh, to build an economy that's competitive and prosperous, uh, we found that the, pros the process has changed. If you look at this previous slide, uh, and particularly this previous slide, when you think about competitiveness, the agony of competitiveness is everything matters. The schools matter, the roads matter, everything matters to competitiveness. Uh, therefore, in order to improve competitiveness, you have to have a sustained, relentless effort to upgrade the standard in your region. So you've got to be improving the schools, you've got to be improving the technical schools, you've got to be improving the university base, you've got to be improving the physical infrastructure, you've got to make sure the airport's efficient, 
You got it, it's on and on. It's a, a never ending process of dealing with lots and lots of different sorts of things that all combine to shape the productivity of the region. And what we find is that if you see economic development as just something that the government does, it'll never get done. And it won't be sustained. Uh, you know, if your economic development plan in, in the region is, 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 is something that the mayor announces, you know, at the beginning of his term, <coughs> or her term, uh, that's always a death knell. You've got to have an economic development process that just keeps going on. It doesn't matter who the mayor is. It just keeps rolling. Because you've got institutions in place and you've got the private sector engagement and the university, the people that are going to be there, no matter what government is in power, those are the people who have to do economic development. And how to organize yourself to do that is something that we've learned a lot about. Again, I don't have time to cover all these subjects. Are very important subjects, but I'm just giving you a taste of this. Remember, this is just sort of a, a little tasting menu. And we can go into depth in any of these topics if you're interested later. Now, when we look at an economy like the Columbus area economy, when we look at it, we see three very different kinds of businesses in that economy. We see uh, some businesses are in your region at least conceptually, I'm not saying they are because we're not looking at Columbus yet, we're looking at the United States. Some industries are located in a particular location because of natural resources. Okay, So if you happen to have coal deposits in Columbus, there might be some firms there that do coal. Okay, So that's one class of firms in a regional economy, people that are there because of natural resource endowments. As you can see here, less than 1% of all U.S. jobs now are heavily dependent on natural resources. There's a few still left, but, but very few. Uh, and these are declining. Uh, what surprises many people is that actually the two-thirds of all the jobs in the Columbus region, on average, would be in local industries. These are industries that every region has in roughly the same proportions. Local health services, local construction, retailing, restaurants, things like that. These are businesses that don't compete across geography. They basically serve almost exclusively the local market. And we know that because as we look across the economic geography, we see that every region has these industries in roughly the same proportions. These industries are two-thirds of the jobs, believe it or not. Two-thirds of all the jobs in your region are local. They're serving the local market. Uh, they've actually been, this, this category of jobs has actually been growing faster on average than any other category. Um, but as we'll see later, these jobs have relatively lower average wages. Why? Because these industries tend to deploy less technology, less skill, and therefore they, they, they're less productive. Um, the real core driver of any regional economy is what we call the, the traded cluster. These are the firms in industries that make products and services that are traded across regions. That are, that are products and services that are sold any, so, uh, across, across the state, across the country, across the world in some cases. We see that this is actually a little less than a third of all the jobs on average in the US. They're growing, not hugely rapidly, but they're growing. But look at the average wage of the traded clusters versus the local clusters. Substantially higher. Higher relative wage, 133 versus 84 on a relative standpoint. The wage growth, although the wage, the job growth is higher here, the wage growth is significantly higher here. Uh, and look at the relative productivity as we measure productivity. These are highly, much more productive. And in terms of one of the metrics we use to look at at, at productivity growth, patenting, and which is an indicator of technology, we see, look, the patenting intensity of these industries is, is vastly higher, higher than this. So when we look at uh, your region, we, we, look at, we, we look at a region that's going to consist of these three buckets. Um, these here are important. They're huge for jobs. And we want to make sure that these are as productive as possible. Because if our local businesses are not productive, that will drag down the productivity of our traded businesses because our traded businesses often depend on those local industries. This was a great mistake in Japan, for example. Japan thought that they just worried about the export businesses. They could forget about local construction and 
wholesaling and all that sort of stuff. And it became so costly to do business in Japan because those local industries were protected and subsidized that Japanese companies stopped investing in Japan and started investing offshore. Okay, so you can't ignore the local clusters. They're really important. You want them to be as efficient and, and, and productive as possible. But this is what really drives your economy. These are the really the, 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 the high wage industries that actually, if these do well, these do well. If these guys are supporting high wages and high wage growth, that creates higher and more sophisticated demand for these and, and drives them up. And so we find that the level of traded wages in a region determines the level of local wages in the region. And, uh, and so when you're thinking about your economy, all of them are important, but these you've got to really look at carefully. Okay. Now when we look at the regional economy, what we see then is the traded clusters are very different depending on which region you're looking at. Because there's specialization, uh, and, and regions tend to do best in air, they tend to do best in different fields. So at you know, Raleigh Durham we have one mix of traded clusters, uh, whereas in Houston we have a different mix, in Atlanta we have a different mix, and so forth. So let's, let's now let's have some fun. Let's look at Columbus. Theory part, you know, we've gotten through. Uh, well, first of all, let's let's think about how we measure data for a a, a, a region. There's obviously the city. Um, the, the blue here is what's called the, the, the Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area, SMSA. And the data I'm going to show you is for that particular area of geography. The brown is what's called an economic area. That's a bigger economic unit defined by the Department of Commerce. And if I had a little more time and a little more uh, uh, energy, uh, we could have actually run the data for the economic area as well. Uh, what we're finding is that when you look at a city, you can't think of that city in isolation. You have to think about that city in the context of the surrounding regional economy. Because there's some things that should be done in the city, in the center, but other things that are more efficiently done outside of the city. And having the right efficient spatial distribution of industry is important. But for purposes of the slides that I'm going to show you, I'm showing you the blue and the yellow. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at some of the ways that we would look at the success of an economic area. And unfortunately, our data ends in the year 2001, because that's when the federal government has seen fit to spit out the data. Uh, we are hoping that 2002 shows up soon, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe 2003 someday. The minute we get it, we, we, will, we, will, we will update all this data. But this is as of 2001. For most regions, 2001 was starting to look a little shaky. But it was still sort of the tail end of what had been a very good period. And 2002 generally looks a lot less exciting. But these are all 2001, and when we compare you to other regions, we're comparing you for, for, for that period. And this data tends to look at the decade from 1990 to 2001. Now, uh, Columbus. Uh, according to our data, is the 37th largest SMSA in terms of employment in, in America. So you're, you're pretty big. You're up, up there pretty high in the pecking order. Uh, employment growth, however, you rank 117th. So what, what we'll find here is that Columbus is a pretty good, solid, prosperous, prosperous region. Um, but you're not, you're not, your prosperity is a little bit lagging your, your size in terms of your ranking and your measures of vitality and, and dynamism are the things that cause me to be concerned. So what do I say? So employment growth, 117 versus, versus your size of, of 37. Uh, your employment growth according to our data is a little less than 2% versus almost 25 in the nation as a whole. Unemployment rate, you know, again, good, uh, uh, but, but lower than your, your size rank. Average wage, 53rd for metropolitan areas. Uh, yeah, not bad, good solid ranking. But wage growth, rank 100. Um, so uh, we get the sense that, that this, is, this is a kind of a good solid median level region in terms of performance, but it's lagging a bit on the measures of, of how well are we progressing. 
On the innovation side, we only have a number of measures that we were able to look at here, but, but in terms of patenting rates, patenting we look at as a measure of innovation output. Uh, uh, patents per uh, 10,000 employees in your region are uh, 4.7, uh, you know, rank 149 among regions. So see, we're, we're falling down the pecking order. Uh, you know, size, uh, <coughs> wages, now, now we're down, down lower. Uh, growth in patents. Again, the gap here is a little bit less, but, but again, roughly the same as, as your patenting rate. Uh, trade and establishment formulation. The number of new establishments or entities in the traded economy. How fast are we spitting out <coughs> new entities? Uh, again, your, your, your rank is, is lower, well, well below your, your other rank. So again, I think that, that this is, I think, a sign to me that that this is not a, a region that's in crisis or that there's a, a you know deep economic problems, but it's a region that actually uh, has some issues to, to address in terms of you know what's our vitality, what's what's holding us back here, why aren't we doing better? Now this is the employment in your region uh, by uh, traded cluster, and what you see here is where your region, uh, your SMSA ranks nationally. Uh, in this particular cluster. So your top cluster, according to our data, is financial services. Um, and this is the traded part of financial services. There's also some local financial services. Business services, number two. Distribution services, number three. That's an interesting one. Uh, education and knowledge creation. Uh, so we got some major educational employment in this region. Uh, hospitality and tourism, heavy construction. So look at how the services really dominate. And that's not unusual. That, that, that's typical for all, for all regions. Um, you have a number one ranking actually in construction materials of all metropolitan areas. Uh, your other high rankings, you have pretty high ranking in financial services. Remember, you're 37th largest. So anything where you're higher than 37, you have sort of over penetration. How many regions are there? 318. These, these, these are metropolitan areas. We're not looking at the whole economy. We're looking at just metropolitan areas. Okay, uh, you have an interesting ranking in lighting and electrical commit. Uh, footwear is tiny, but you have an interesting ranking there. Communications equipment, plastics. These are areas where you have some strength as as measured by uh, 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 employment. Okay. Now here's your kind of business portfolio, if you will, in the traded economy. Again, the local economy. You've got pretty much the same local industries that everybody else does. Okay. So we focus here. Uh, we saw the construction materials. We saw the communications equipment. Um, so basically what we do here is we say, OK, where, what's our average share of national employment in the area? So you turn out to be 0.67% of national traded employment in the Columbus metropolitan area. So if, if you have more than that, that means that you have a strength in that cluster. That is, you're over-penetrated. You have more employment there than we would expect, just given your average size. So that's above the line. And then here is where you're kind of gaining position relative to other regions, uh, losing position relative to other regions. Um, and so we see the outliers. Let, let's scroll in on this part of the economy, because uh, uh, th this is perhaps a little bit more interesting. So we see that. Now, financial services is actually quite an interesting case where you're not only are you strong, like you're like kind of double as strong as you would expect given your size, but you're also gaining share. So this is an area of strength, vitality. Distribution services, we see that. I'll show you some examples. Chemicals, lighting, you see that. The interesting growth in IT, uh, which, is, which is nice to see. Um, uh, we do see, however, some large clusters are kind of declining, losing position. Not necessarily declining in absolute terms, but not growing as fast as the cluster is nationally. So again, education knowledge creation, losing relative employment share. What is that? Uh, universities, uh, uh, all kinds of educational institutions, also research organizations, think tanks. There's a whole array of, of, of the businesses that would be in this. Each of these is a collection of, of businesses. Um, uh, but not local schools, not, not anything that would be local and, and everybody would have it, okay? Uh, business services, uh, we're, we're, this is a very large cluster in the U.S. economy and, and we're, this is a mishmash of things, you know, consulting, a whole bunch of things. We'll, we'll look at this in a minute. 
Classics is quite strong, uh, slightly losing a, a little bit of share. So that, that's kind of uh, what the portfolio looks like. That is actually not an alarming chart. I've looked at a lot of these in a lot of regions. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got some good, strong things that are doing well. You've got some emerging things that are, that are gaining position. Uh, it's not an alarming position, but it also wouldn't look like Atlanta or, or a region that's really steaming ahead. There would tend to be a lot of stuff up in the upper room. Here's where the jobs were created over the decade from 1990 to 2001. And what we see here, the little blue line would be the national benchmark. So basically in financial services, if you just grew as fast as national financial services, you would have created this many jobs. But you actually created this many. And that's why you're gaining share. See? So you did well here. But in business services, national benchmark, you would have created that many jobs. And, and you only created that many. So the, the, the Columbus as kind of a business services hub is losing position. Okay? Uh, transportation logistics, quite, quite high job generation. Distribution, again, overperformed. Communications equipment, overperformed. This has been flat uh, nationally over this period. Where did you lose? Well, well, the good news is there's not any big disasters. I'm doing a project now in the state of South Carolina, and you know, they got some big disasters. Uh, uh, you don't. Uh, Motor-driven products, these are a variety of things that are unified by the fact that there's a, 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 a motor at the core of, of whatever it is. Uh, analytical instruments, some small job losses. Automotive, some small job losses. So uh, this is basically a healthy story that you're, you are creating net, net, net traded jobs. That's why your unemployment rate is pretty low. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's interesting to look at this mix and and, 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 and see what, what it's telling us about, about the, the nature of our economy, where we're working well, where we're working poorly. Uh, what I've given you in your data pack is sort of now, let's take each one of our clusters and tear it apart a little bit. This is financial services. Where we're really doing well in financial services is insurance. That's, that's steaming ahead, uh, growing, generating most all of the jobs that were generated in this cluster came out of insurance. Uh, we can show you which companies those are. We can give you the companies in each of these bubbles to the extent that the data is not perfect. We can give you a lot of the list of who, who's here, who's there, and who's there. Again, all this stuff we have and, and we'll be happy to share with you. Um, this starts to give you kind of this uh, picture of, of what's your economy, how is it evolving, uh, uh, what can we do to make it better. See, here, here's the uh, insurance dominates the jobs. Um, uh, 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 but uh, here's another pattern we tend to see in, in Columbus as we flip through a lot of these charts. We tend to see that, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have decent wages. But these charts on wages, this little diamond is the national average wage in that subcluster. So, yes, you have securities brokers, dealers, and exchange employment in your region. But, you know, compared to the average national wage in that, you're low. So we see that in software and computer programming. We see that in a lot of fields. In the so many advanced services fields and advanced manufacturing fields, you're there, but you're in segments or you're doing things that are only supporting a somewhat lower wage. So that tells us that you know we've got to find a way to, to raise the, the, the skill base, raise the sophistication, raise the technology base of our economy uh, uh, and, 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 and essentially drive the wages up. Okay, now, what I've talked about so far, and I've taken 98% of my time already, is the regional economy as a whole. And there's so much more to talk about, and so much more we could cover in terms of how to, how, how to think about it, how to diagnose it, what to do about it. We can cover that in the Q&A. Now, as requested, I'd like to scroll down from the region as a whole to the actually the urban core. Because what we find is that in many regions, we have sort of a donut effect. And that is we have a pretty high level of prosperity around the tasty part. But then there's kind of a hole in the middle. And there's actually quite a bit of poverty and unemployment and lack of economic success right in the middle of the donut, right in the actual inner city itself. And that's also true in Columbus based on what little data. Again, we've got a little data done here, but, but not a whole lot. But that, that is an issue. 
And so one of the things we, we, we understand is that that situation actually is intolerable in the long run. We can't have a healthy regional economy unless our urban core is healthy. Why, how do I know that? Because that's what the data tells us. The data tells us that it, it, regional vitality is affected by the vitality of, of, of the core. Now, th there's been a wide recognition that inner cities are a big problem in the United States. We know that poverty in the U.S. is concentrated in inner cities. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're not, you know, Houston or, 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 or Los Angeles, but, but you have your own version of a, an issue of, of the uh, urban core not being as vital as, as the rest of the region. What do we do about that? Well, the traditional kind of way of dr addressing the urban core was a, a, a model that looked like this. Basically, the whole focus was how can we help these poor people? The way to help them is to figure out all the deficiencies that they have and all the social needs they have, housing, health care, uh, you know, et cetera, and pour money and resources into that. Um, the economic space that was looked at was the neighborhood. So we had all these community development corporations, neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block. And the lead actor in this process was government. That is, it was government's job to deal with all these poor people in the neighborhoods by helping them address their, their social needs. And that is correct as far as it goes. That is, the f folks living in these communities have a lot of needs. And housing stocks are uh, uh, not up, up to snuff, and home ownership is low, and uh, uh, education levels are inadequate. And so all that effort was critically necessary to kind of get us to a certain level. But, but what we've come to believe is that that's not enough. That you can't just try, you just, you can't just try to, uh, to, to, to focus on the weaknesses and deficiencies. You actually have to make sure that you also think about how to create a healthy economic base in those communities. Because unless these urban core areas are participating in the economy, unless the residents of these communities can actively participate in the economy, uh, then there's no amount of money that will ever solve this problem. Because it'll just, we'll just be ameliorating a problem rather than dealing with the underlying solution. So, so what we've been working on is to say, okay, let's view the inner city not only as a social problem but also as an economic problem. And how, what steps can we take to actually build healthy economies in our urban core? Now, for many people, that seems to be an impossible dream. Because I mean, people kind of assume that, well, the place where the economic activity should really be is in the suburbs. But actually, what we come to find is that that's actually not the natural state of affairs. In, in fact, the urban core ought to be a very vital economic region. If we think about it the right way, and, and, that, and, we, and we can change that in many cities. So what we've been doing in our work on inner cities is to say, okay, let's change the model here. Let's keep doing some of this stuff, but let's also think about not just reducing poverty, but creating jobs and wealth. Uh, not just focusing on deficiencies, but where, where could we find the competitive advantages? Where could we find the assets of our urban core? What could we build on in terms of an economic base? Uh, rather than looking at the neighborhood, let's look at the whole region <laughs> and think about where the urban core could fit into the spatial uh, economy of the region. And, and again, how can we kind of shift the, the leadership? Now, uh, the, basic, uh, uh, the basic starting point for, for thinking about how to revitalize the urban core is to say, okay, what are the competitive advantages that the urban core might have as a place for business? What sort of businesses should be uh, thriving in those areas versus the suburbs. And the basic theory, and, and again, I don't have time to cover all of this, is that there, there's, there's again four key hooks that we find for urban economic development. Number one, is the one, one hook is the workforce. Uh, we often have, uh, th this seems a little strange now because we've been in sort of an economic downturn, but we are facing a worker shortage in America. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And we're going to have no workers very soon. Uh, and the economy <coughs> just continues a little bit longer. We're already seeing uh, uh, the, 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 the changes. Uh, the reason we know we're not going to have any workers is that the workforce is growing at 1%, and the economy is growing at 25 or 
and remember what it was like, uh, you know, before we hit the downturn. It was impossible to find workers. And the last, basically, pool of underutilized workers in most regions is in the urban core. And so it's absolutely, uh, th that becomes a real asset. And, and for businesses that don't require very high levels of skilled people, the urban core becomes a, a critical place. In fact, before the downturn, we had companies starting to move back into the urban core. Uh, because that was the place where they could attract and retain a, a workforce. A second thing we find in the urban core, and, and again, I don't know Columbus here, so I can't tell you how much these principles map. All of them, all of them don't necessarily map. What we tend to find in the urban core is because of population density, even though the average income is low, we tend to see a very large market for retail goods and services, and often commercial goods and services that has been abandoned. Uh, all the retailers moved out, all the, you know, all the supermarkets moved out, and, and there's a, a pool of underutilized demand that often can be a really important engine for getting investment flowing back into those regions. The data we have on Columbus suggests that this is absolutely true in Columbus, that in the so-called inner city areas of Columbus, which we've tried to chart, and I'll show you that in a minute, the, the actually purchasing power per square mile is much higher in the urban core than it is in the region as a whole, yet I, I don't know to the degree to which the retailers have actually come back to the urban core in your community. They are starting to come back in some parts of the country. Um, we find that the urban core is truly a strategic location uh, near the central business district, near the transportation network. So in businesses that are logistically sensitive, uh, that require a lot of deliveries and, and logistics, the urban core tends to be a good location. And then we find opportunities to link the urban core locations to the clusters in the, in the regional economy. And the basic principle is to look at the city, look at the region, understand what that urban core looks like, what assets it brings as a business location, and then start to change the mindset. Start to change the mindset towards what can we do to enhance and encourage and revitalize our business base in the urban core. How can we improve the business environment? How can we deal with the things that the city is doing to, to get in the way, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, again, just a little bit of data and then I'm going to stop. These green census tracts are defined as economically distressed urban neighborhoods using our methodology. We look at three metrics. We've got poverty rate, unemployment rate, and average income. And based on those three metrics, we would take all the census tracts in a city or metropolitan area and we would classify them as being uh, uh, economically stressed inner city or, or not. And using our methodology, these areas, which mean something to you, they mean nothing to me, uh, are, are actually the ones that qualify as, 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 as economically distressed. Okay? In these green census tracts, we find 26% of the city's total population according to our data. Okay. Um, uh, now, in these census tracts, there are about 6,000 establishments. So there is a business space, uh, uh, and, and a fairly substantial business space, of employing a, a fair number of workers. But we find that, like in many cities, the employment growth in that area is actually negative 1.3% whereas the average employment growth uh, is, is much higher in, in the MSA. So, so this is a classic pattern. This area you know, often has a business base, it's, but it's not been looked at as a place in which economic development and business development is the central agenda. It's been looked at as a place where we've got to deal with the poor people. Uh, the largest inner city clusters in Columbus are all, four of them are local clusters, which is not atypical. Um, and, and, and we see some substantial financial services employment. So this is kind of a snapshot which really tells us that, you know, Columbus does have an inner city and it is not economically vital. And so we, we're, we're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not breaking that particular trend. Um, so here's some more other statistics about your inner city. Uh, again, about 187,000 uh, people. Uh, you know, substantially lower median household income, 25 versus rest of city, 43 versus rest of MSA, 52. This is household income, not individual wage. Unemployment rate, three times higher. High school attainment, lower. Not disastrously lower, but, but, but lower. 
minority population, substantial, although this is not a high percent for, for, for perspective of all cities. Uh, you know, fairly young population, but actually a lower young population than, than outside. Uh, home ownership rate, you know, lower. Income density, purchasing power per square mile, actually 57 uh, uh, 1,000 versus 7 in the MSA. So you, you can see that, that there's a lot of concentrated purchasing power there. That's why retailers should be in, in these communities because they actually are very good markets uh, and, and we're seeing, seeing that all across the country. A couple more data slides and, and then, uh, then we'll stop. Uh, uh, this, this measures uh, some measures of the business base. So, you know, the employment, I said 36,000, 6,000 establishments. Uh, negative growth here, slow growth in the city, pretty rapid growth outside of the city. Um, business startups, interestingly enough, pretty equal. <coughs> Bankruptcy is actually lower. So uh, this is an, an interesting, uh, here's the uh, sort of the portfolio chart for that, of the inner city area. And you can see, again, some, 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 uh, some good things and, and some bad things. This, this looks at how much the urban core is of the metropolitan area's employment. Uh, and then, you know, is it growing or, or shrinking? We've got too many big bubbles below the line that are shrinking. But this, what this says is that 50% of all the metropolitan area's transportation and logistics is actually in, in the urban core. So that's a sign of one of those competitive advantages. You know, if you're going to run a transportation and logistics operation, you want to be in the center. So you can go out as opposed to be out trying to fight your way around and in. Um, so again, I, I've kind of given you a lot, some data here, some, some thoughts. I guess what I would just uh, close with is that um, today, you know, um, we are in a very, very uh, open and competitive economy. Uh, your region is competing not only with every other region in America, but it's also competing with other locations around the world. Uh, we're never going to win based on low wages. We'll never, we'll never win. If, if all we offer is low wages or low cost of doing business because we have you know, low electric <coughs> power cost or cheap water or you know, whatever, we'll never win that game. You won't win it even in America because there are many other places in America that are much lower cost places to do business than, than Columbus uh, as a region. Uh, so in order to have a vital economy, we've got to figure out what we need to do to create a more productive, more sophisticated environment in which the business can operate. And in order to do that, we found that, that we need to not think about some general policies like, uh, uh, you know, uh, it just improving the roads. But we've also got to start to think about clusters and where we can develop unique specializations and unique assets and unique technical uh, expertise and unique educational programs and unique think tanks and, and university research institutes, we're going to need to start to think about how we can be unusually productive and unusually competitive in a field. But when we think about economic development, we can't just think about the, the region. We also have to put a lot of weight on the urban core as well because that turns out to be often one of the things that's really very strongly affecting the overall results of the region as a whole. Okay. Well, uh, I can stay a little bit longer if anybody has any questions. And again, I hope this will encourage you to do a little bit more work on this. I don't know what your plans are, but I'd be interested in, in hearing about those as well. David? Michael. It, and you're a Harvard guy. You're not in Columbus. <laughs> but if, if, if you were a member of the partnership, and once you got in your head around this, and you went home to Columbus, <coughs> and you think, okay, where do we go from here? Yeah. Where do we look for other models <coughs> in the United States that might be somewhere in our air, in our, in, in, look like us, but yeah. have also been become more vital? Right. Where would you look, and how would you do it? Yeah. Well, um, we can. Um, uh, first of all, I think what this says is that if you haven't already done it, every so often, every community ought to do sort of a competitive assessment. Where are we? And the most important thing you do a competitive assessment about usually is about your economy and, and its health. So, so I think you know I think that's one implication. And and so this is just a teaser. You know this is just the beginning of, of what that process is. And ideally, out of that process would not only come you know where you're doing well, where you're doing poorly, but why? What are the issues? You know what are the challenges? What are the constraints? What are the weaknesses that we need to address? And. Uh, 
uh, why is this happening and what can we do about it? And so I think the second point I make is that the regions that do well have a strategy. You know, Research Triangle was just a bunch of cornfields. And then they had an idea that they could take these three universities that happened to be there, pretty much completely disconnected from the economy historically. And they could take these three universities and create a strategy around them. And it took a long time, it took 20 years or so, but then they ended up with a very vital, dynamic region. Okay? So you need a strategy. You need, you need to do a competitive assessment, you need to do a strategy. Uh, who should do that? Uh, we believe it should be done with sort of a, a, a group that, that crosses the constituencies that I've been talking about. Obviously the government has to be involved, but the private sector and this group is an excellent starting point to be the champion of, of that effort. Um, and so you need to organize yourself. And you need to create an organization that has an enduring commitment to carrying this on over time rather than just wants to have a, a, a burst of, of energy and get everybody excited for a, a year and then have it die out. So that's, that's the third implication. In terms of looking for models, um, we've, actually, uh, we've actually done some, some studies. I, didn't, uh, I, I, I realized too late last night that I should have brought you some documents that I can give you that actually document a number of other regions that are interesting, that have done interesting things. So we can share with you a lot of a lot of material. I'd be happy to share it with whoever here is the, is the lead person. You, you have a team of analysts in the, in the private sector as well as at the business school who right. are working yes. with yeah. regions and right. Now. Yeah, I mean we have an interesting story here because uh, there's there's two. There, I, I work with the in, in inner city initiative is an organization I created to work on the urban core issues. And they've actually worked with Milwaukee, and you happen to have the person who, we, who, who knows that case very well. So you could hear about that example. That's an example of working on the urban core issue. There, uh, it, it so happens that uh, the ICIC is working with Akron right now. And uh, the reason we're working with Akron is that the mayor uh, has been the mayor for forever, I understand. I've met him just once. He's also now the chairman of the Conference of Mayors. <laughs> and so one of the things we're trying to do is get him to be a national leader in kind of putting out some of this thinking uh, with his colleagues. So uh, the ICIC is one asset that can be perhaps helpful in looking at the urban core issues, particularly. With respect to the economy as a whole, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have tremendous data sets that we have, uh, and, and I'd be happy to make those available. That, that's a Harvard. Uh, uh, and, and then there are some uh, firms on the outside that can, can, can do this kind of work. Uh, and again, we can give you some examples of that. But it, it's the kind of thing that, that you have, you know, you, you're, you're here talking about a lot of different issues. And, you know, you've got to decide which two or three of those are the most important for the long-term future of the region right now. And you might conclude that the economy is okay. I mean, it's, it's not great. You know, but it's, it's certainly not, uh, <clears throat> I've seen a lot worse, frankly. And I've seen a lot of depressed people sitting around a room like this, wondering why their unemployment rate is double the national average, you know, and, and so you're not in that case. So you may not conclude that the economy is the, it, but, but what we found is the economy is so crucial to everything else. If you have a good economy, then all of a sudden dealing with educational issues and so forth becomes, becomes a lot easier. So. So you've got to decide what your pecking order, but if the economy is, comes up high on your radar screen, or if the inner city part of the economy comes up high on your radar screen, then, I, then you need to kind of have a strategy. Yes, sir? The, uh, you, during your speech, it sounded as though uh, trading clusters and local clusters um, had to be in similar balance in the inner city versus the suburbs. There could be, presumably, strategies in which the trading cluster was around the circle, but, Absolutely. The, but the local cluster was in the circle. And indeed, your Raleigh-Durham example, is a, a research triangle example, is not an inner city development. No, that, it, they, they have very few inner city issues <coughs> in, in, that, in that region. Uh, they have relatively small urban centers. And um, the, um, the, uh, they, they created essentially a large park um, that, that was sort of between those three universities, and that's where they 
they, 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 they poured their attention in terms of improving the, the vitality of the business environment and connecting all the institutions in. So I, we can, I can send you actually a story about that particular case. But no, it, we would expect that the urban core would be the place where some of the local services were provided. So it's not at all surprising to see you know, financial services in the urban core, local health. You tend to have hospital complexes. You tend to have universities, in many cases, located in the urban core. All that is perfectly natural. Um, so I'm not implying that uh, there should be an equal balance within the region. But what we find is across regions, we tend to find about the same proportion of local industries or local clusters in every region we look at. And you all are, are pretty much average there. You, you don't have a very high level of trade and employment. You don't have a low level. You're pretty much on the median. Um, yes, sir? You said that the data suggests that the health of the uh, inner city, the urban core, is a key factor in determining the health of the region. Right. What's the conceptual basis for that? Well, um, for, first of all, it's, it's just, um, it, part of it is just simply math, you know, that if the urban core is 166,000 people and they have very, very, very low average incomes, then that simply pulls down the average for the whole region. So that, that's part of it. But what we what we, we, we what we find found is that in fact I have a slide which I skipped over. Yep. If you have a a, a a a healthy urban core, you get some benefits. Number one, you free up resources in terms of, 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 of a public investment that is now going to address the distress. And that the, that resource gets to be invested more broadly in the region. Um, you tend, to, you tend to see that, that congestion, urban sprawl, some of the problems that many regions have can be mitigated if, if your urban core is healthy. Um, and so rather than driving more and more uh, destruction of more and more green space to farther and farther away, you, you end up with a situation where your urban core is, has good healthy neighborhoods and people want to live there and people move back in. And, and, and all of a sudden, your, your infrastructure in the region gets more efficiently utilized rather than stretched. And have, you don't have to build more and more and more infrastructure. Um, we find that, that often regions face constraints of economic growth in terms of labor force and land and infrastructure. And if you get the urban core healthy, uh, you, you, you add resources that, 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 that allow you to grow faster. So the, I've made the point about the workforce. Uh, you know, if, if, if Columbus region is tapped out in terms of workers, and you still have 150,000 underemployed people, boy, that, that gives you another, another round of growth. So, and then there's this issue of spatial organization of industry. Some things are more efficiently done in the urban core. Other things are more efficiently done on the periphery. So you know, we would tend to see transportation logistics, food processing, um, um, you know, uh, tertiary health care. All those things should really be happening in the urban core, gathering people from the, the, whole, the whole economic area. Uh, whereas if the urban core is, 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 is failing, then you end, up, you end up driving businesses out of that urban core and you have less efficiency in the economy. So that, that would be kind of the conceptual underpinnings of why you should care beyond equity, beyond just doing the right thing, why you should care economically about the health of the, of the urban core. One more? You've done some writing on corporate philanthropy. Right. Does it have a role in building competitiveness? Absolutely. Uh, I, I guess I, I understand Mark Kramer, my, yes. my co-author, is, is coming in today. And, um, I think that, uh, this is good, I have only 30 seconds, so I'm going to be a little provocative. Here. I think that, that, that the economic health of the region is probably the area where corporate philanthropy can have the biggest potential impact. Because who knows better what it takes to build a healthy economy than the private sector? And that the private sector ought to be thinking about how to deploy its corporate philanthropy that in ways that really improve the business vitality and the business context in, in the region. And that's an area where corporations have unusual expertise and unusual knowledge. So, so um, uh, I, I would, I, I think that, I also would say the same thing about the Community Foundation. I, I don't know the Community Foundation in Columbus, but 
But I think the Community Foundation has a special role. It's the guy who asked the question. Okay. <laughs> the Community Foundation, I think, also has a very fundamental role in, in, in the sort of economic development of the region. So, so the private sector philanthropy working closely with Community Foundation, I think, is a very excellent uh, uh, a focal point here. But you're going to need some kind of an organizational structure. Perhaps this partnership can be the core of that in order to do the, do the assessment, do the research, um, develop a strategy and then and then sustain the implementation over time. And I'll I'll get to to uh, you some documents that will that will hopefully add further thoughts. David. Michael Porter, thank you very much.